next panel, we're, um, the, it's going to be moderated by Hila Rasul Ayub, who's the Director of Planetary Politics at New America. She's a former Director of Global Engagement at the National Security Council. Hila will uh, introduce our other two panelists. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so grateful that we weren't right after lunch, uh, so we had a bit of a warm up. Um, and thank you, Peter, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm so glad that so many of you I, all can join us for what I think is a very critical, important, and timely conversation. Our panel um, will be exploring the intersection of the challenge of climate mi induced migration. So, so often we think of these big disasters, floods, displacing communities, sometimes cross-border, sometimes internally. But what we're going to see increasingly is um, the impact of slow onset climate on the movement of people, both within their countries and across borders. So with that, I'm very pleased to be introducing um, our panelists today. Um, Dr. Peter Schlosser is Vice President and Vice Provost of the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory at Arizona State University in Phoenix, where they just hit 100 days of 100 degree plus weather. More than that. More than that. <laughs> He holds uh, joint appointments in the School of Sustainability, the School of Ocean Futures, the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and the School of Sustainable Engineering in the Built Environment. And we are also joined um, by Elizabeth Campbell, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration at the U U.S. Department of State, where she is responsible for humanitarian assistance in Africa and multilateral coordination and external affairs. Prior to this position, Campbell was director of UNRWA's representative office in Washington, DC. She has also worked with Refugees International and the UN Refugee Agency in Kenya. So I'd like to kick off this discussion with a somewhat contested number, and we discussed this in the green room just now. 1.2 billion people could be displaced globally by 2050 due to climate change and natural disasters. So whether this number is accurate or not, the reality is that we are already seeing larger numbers of displaced populations globally, and we're increasingly seeing it internally in the US as well. So I'm gonna to turn to you, Dr. Schlosser, just to quickly give us a, a broad view of what the science is telling us about the climate emergency and how this is going to be impacting the migration of people globally. And yeah, let's put that a bit into a larger context. We have actually over the past 100 plus years, definitely since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we have put increasing pressure on the Earth system, on the life supporting system for a growing population. We often use climate as an example for that because, well, you can feel it if it's hot, uh, you can feel it if you get more cyclones, precipitation patterns, drought patterns, etc. But climate is actually not a root cause. Climate is an outcome of more and more people using more energy of the wrong source, fossil fuels. That loads the atmosphere with carbon dioxide and that leads to global warming. Now, if we are looking at where are we in terms of warming, because a lot of people say, I hear one degree Celsius, I hear 1.5 degrees Celsius. Yeah, between day and night, I see 10 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius. So why should I worry about that one degree Celsius? That is the confusion between weather and climate, right? If you average these cycles that you feel day and night over a longer period of time, then you have climate. And just to put that 1.5 degrees Celsius into context, because that's a Paris Accord that, by the way, we will not manage to hold at, but if we take that number and say, what does that mean in history? So a lot of people have a sense that glacial times were much different than the interglacial or warm period that we're living in right now. So if you average temperature globally over the planet and compare an ice age and the present time, the temperature difference was only five degrees Celsius. So we are now moving almost one third of that full amplitude between an ice age and a warm age into a warmer climate. So we are not just tinkering a little bit at the edges with the climate system, we are changing the climate system 
fundamentally. And keep in mind, during the last ice age, just a little bit north of here, over New York, Central Park, there was an ice sheet of one kilometer thickness, so there was absolutely no life possible. So we have to keep that in mind, that we are actually pushing natural limits, and we are not pushing it back towards an ice age, which the natural cycle would have been. We are pushing it into warmer climates, climates that we have not seen for many, many millions of years. On top of that, we also do experience rapid transitions within that slow buildup of temperatures. And that is something that we are not prepared for, but it's not an abstract issue anymore. You all know from your own experience or from listening to the news that we see extreme events almost daily now, definitely weekly. If any of you follows global heat maps, you will see that there are more and more places, hotspots on the globe, where the heat is so extreme that it gets to human health to the point where people are perishing in the thousands, sometimes in the 10,000s. So that is where we are right now. Looking ahead, we had a, a laudable goal to hold global warming at 1.5 Celsius. That was the goal of the Paris Accord that was you know, agreed upon about 10 years ago, 2015. We are actually way, way behind that uh, goal, and we will, in my view, hit two Celsius rather than stopping at 1.5. Some people in the community are a little bit more pessimistic than I am and say we might actually go to three. If that would happen, coming back to your number, by 2075, there are some projections based on the best models that we have that say that at such a point, there will be two to three billion people who are suffering from extreme heat, many of them to the point where an ex a further existence is not possible. So it's, it's not abstract anymore, it's real, we are facing it, we are just, in my view, normalizing it, we are not paying enough attention, and that is something that will catch up with us in the near future. Okay, thank you. And Elizabeth, I mean, from your perch at PRM, we do, we're just talking about numbers. Um, what sorts of um, climate-induced migration patterns is PRM and State Department, the U.S. government at large, tracking? And what are the sorts of numbers that are important in the policymaking space? Yeah, thank you for that. So, I mean, I think what is overwhelmingly clear is that we've moved from a period where, at least in our bureau at the State Department, we look at forced migration primarily through the lens of persecution and conflict to a much wider lens to also include these extreme weather events. And across the globe in every region, there's an inherent link. They are the two top drivers of all forced migration globally, for which we have sort of responsibility um, uh, and, and understanding. And this, of course, is happening in a world in which migration itself um, is rapidly uh, increasing. I think one obvious example is in the Western Hemisphere, and if we look at our own southwest border. When we talk to and our partners talk to migrants who are presenting at our border, one of the key reasons that they are moving throughout the region um, is lack of access to livelihood, which is directly linked um, to changes in climate and their inability to, to survive in these places. So we know it is a core factor. And I would say that one of the biggest problems that we have, getting to your question about how we track it, is that we do not have the conceptual, legal, or operational frameworks um, in our government or in an intergovernmental system to respond effectively. We have tools that were designed to address different types, or forced migration caused by different, uh, for different reasons. So here, especially the asylum, the institution of asylum, that's about persecution. It is not about people who can no longer survive in the places in which they were born because of climate. So this is why I think you see all of us sort of grappling with what do you do? Um, because even the tools that we have available, the resources that we have available, the political support that underpins those tools, resources, and institutions is not there for the picture that you just described. Um, so for us, um, I mean, I will be honest, it would, I, could, I could tell you all of the things that we are doing, but the honest answer is um, we're just getting started and, and we're behind.
that's an <laughs> incredibly frightening because where we are seeing the rapidest, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Schlapp, but um, we are seeing the rapidest climate change impacts taking place in regions and in countries and in communities that are already experiencing a lot of conflict, a lot of fragility, mostly due to scarcity of resources. And so I think, you know, I'm, I'm really thinking of the Sahel, the Middle East, and, and other areas that, you know, you just mentioned in Central America as well. So how are these connect, are, how do we see the connections between conflict, climate, and how can we better think about the data that can sub, uh, better support that nexus? I mean, what's very clear is that in the places where we, the United States government, are providing the largest amounts of global humanitarian assistance it, are the same places suffering um, extreme um, climatic uh, events. So let me just point to, two, uh, point to three examples. Somalia, you know, this past, over the past couple of years, um, we responded to the fourth consecutive drought and our response, getting back to this question about do we have the right tools to meet this moment, our response fundamentally at this point, the resources that we have available, is about food assistance, right? It's a very expensive operation. Uh, take a completely different context, very fertile place on the Nile, South Sudan. I was just there uh, in July. It's stunning when you go because you think, my God, this could be the you know, agricultural basket of, of this region. Instead, what it is, is a floodplain. Mm -hmm. um, and people cannot rely on traditional or agricultural ways of survival because of unmitigated and expansive and increasing flooding. It, and when you fly over, what you think you are looking at is a lake. Um, it is one of the most stunning things uh, to see. But that means that our response to date right now is providing roughly you know, 70 to 80% of the people who the UN has identified in need of uh, food assistance, food. And the biggest conflict happening there is over access to food. That is how dire, and the, the relationship between conflict and um, these environmental catastrophes is, is so deeply linked you can't separate it. Look to at Sudan, and I just asked the team before I came here to pull the statistics. Um, from the recent flooding. So this is one of the worst um, violent conflicts in the world, which has created a massive displacement crisis. And then on top of that, you layer climate. So they've just experienced some significant flooding. It affected over almost half a million people, killed over 200, destroyed 60,000 houses, lost livelihoods, displaced 136,000 of which 50% were already dis displaced from the, the violent conflict. So the linkage is just, it's everywhere. And again, our, the tool that we have to respond to this is humanitarian assistance, right? Which is temporary, is short term, and certainly not in and of itself um, a solution. So we can't go anywhere really, um, but especially in, on the continent, East Horn of Africa, um, across to coastal West Africa and look at these things as if they're separate phenomenon. The days of understanding forced migration through a persecution lens um, is, is alone is, is really over. I'd love to get back to that point, but first I, I want to turn to you, Dr. Schlosser. You know, we've you know, thrown out certain regions, but from where you sit, where do you see future migratory uh, pa uh, migration patterns of, of peoples and, you know, we were talking about this just now, I think, you know, in terms of the importance of this issue in policy making spaces hasn't been taken as seriously as it should because for the most part, it's impacted mostly communities that are already marginalized and have the least voice in these types of fora. So where do you see larger migration patterns taking place in the next 10, 20 years? And then where are we going to start seeing it where it could potentially impact policy? I mean, just starting with, uh, with the southwest uh, of, of the ESNA, mm -hmm. it, it's actually highlighting one of the hotspots, which is Middle America, okay. where a combination of climate-induced effects and political instability are leading to migration into the southwest of the United States, and that is uh, politically already a hot button. It, it's actually interesting that uh, 
a lot of these migrants, if they manage to come across the border, are moving into an area that in itself is changing rapidly. If you look at the southwest, so Phoenix, um, my home, um, this year, since May 27, there was not a single day with temperatures below 100 Fahrenheit. For those of you who like to think in Celsius, that's 37.8 Celsius. So that's about 110 days successively. We also broke the record in 90 degree nights. Last year, we had 31 consecutive days in July and beginning of August with temperatures above 110. That's 43.8 Celsius. So we are actually, even in the area that could take in some of these uh, migrants, uh, conditions are changing. But now, more globally, one factor that you all heard about uh, that will affect the way the world works is sea level rise. Mm -hmm. So we have increasing temperatures over massive ice shields and mountain glaciers. Quite a few of the mountain glaciers, Kilimanjaro, for example, is without ice. Uh, you heard in the Alps, in the Southern Alps, in Alaska, the mountain glaciers are receding very quickly, but the massive ice sheets are sitting on Greenland and Antarctica. And Greenland is melting at a rate much higher than we had originally thought from physical science perspectives, because nonlinearity is setting in that shed some of the ice fairly quickly. So looking at projections forward, at the end of this century, the global sea level will rise because of the addition of this fresh water from land by anywhere between one and three meters, three to nine feet. What does that mean? Look at Bangladesh, look at the Netherlands, look at some of the areas around the US, uh, look at uh, Miami. Hundreds of millions, many hundreds of millions of people will be affected let alone low-lying island nations, many of them will actually disappear. So that is one major area where we will see that. On top of that, 90 percent, uh, you, you all are aware of that, 90 percent of the exchange of goods internationally are going across the ocean. You just have to look at shipping routes and you see the ocean is pretty much covered with shipping routes. By definition, all the infrastructure for port infrastructure for that shipping is at sea level. So now imagine you, you raise that by nine feet. We have not even started to think what that means. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we have a lot of urban centers moving towards the coast, and we have more and more people moving into urban centers. So we will have more people moving into the quote-unquote danger zone. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the areas. And then, of course, in the interior of continents where you are heating up, you will see more more effects from droughts. Um, we, we saw some of the, um, the Sahel uh, migration. We saw some in the Middle East, uh, Syria. And what is, and you know that much better, you know that much better than I do, but as part of the Global Futures Laboratories activities, we are sort of looking at the interconnected effects. And what I observe in Europe, for example, and just take that as one example, an addition of 1% of migrants to a population can completely upset the structures there. So we are so finely tuned into ways that we have uh, been used to for many, many years, or hundreds of years, that little perturbations, a small addition of migrants might actually cause major political problems. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing that increasingly, and that in a political landscape that in itself is shifting. So. We, we do have quite a few issues ahead of us. I also want to make sure that I'm not saying we are now going from being deniers of climate change to fatalists and say, well, you know, all these problems, we, we cannot do anything. Let's just write it out and leave it to the next generations. We have a responsibility to use the knowledge that we have much more effectively because we know more than we are using. There is much more out there that could be applied that would help lessen the negative impacts than we are doing. So, so there is the bad news. We have to face the consequences of our over-exploitation of natural resources that leads to things like climate change. Good news is 
we also have learned quite a bit of what can be done. But now we, it's really the challenge is to use that knowledge and make sure that we decrease the negative impacts. I mean, you've been working in these spaces for, for a long time, and you have been working with UN agencies uh, on these sets of issues. You know, if we are looking at this global problem and the UN uh, system has tried to, you know, bring more awareness, tried to deal with it from a programmatic perspective, but what is still missing from that conversation? It is the translation. I mean, you, you, you had the Kyoto Protocol that, mm -hmm. that just did not work because, <laughs> you know, if you want to get 192 uh, plus countries uh, agree to the same thing, that simply doesn't work. The Paris Accord is more on a voluntary basis, but we are falling behind the, the NDAs, um, NDCs, uh, so that, that's, a, that's a problem. I think part of it is that once you get from something that is, let's say, scientifically suggested option that should work mm -hmm. into the implementation space, then you are confronted with many other pressures that politicians have, and that the one that has to do with the environment often is pushed onto the long time scale. Right. I mean, I had the fortune that I saw pretty much every part of the world. I was in Antarctica, I was at the North Pole. In 87, we tried to go with the icebreaker to the pole to investigate many parts of that system. We really bounced, literally bounced back of ice flows that were 10 feet, 20 feet thick. In 91, with two icebreakers, we had no problem to get to the pole. Today, if you come in from the Pacific to Bering Strait, you might get to the North Pole without encountering any ice in summer. Even flying out of um, Greenland, which we do, landing on the ice, we now have trouble to find ice that's thick enough to land a twin order, and the ice only has to be about 60 centimeters, two feet. So I could see in front of my eyes how these things are changing. For many people, it's more abstract, but it becomes increasingly real because the effects are not just in remote areas anymore. They are around us. That's right. Uh, Elizabeth, from the U.S. government perspective, I mean, I think especially since 2015 and the Paris Agreement, uh, you know, we've seen a definite shift in language, but there's still a lot to be done. We still don't have a definition on climate migrants or climate refugees. So that's one part of it. So while there is a lot more collaboration within the US government among the interagency, USAID, uh, State Department, uh, as well as others, what is missing there in that relationship and what more could be done? Um, it's a big question. <laughs> so look, I think one, one issue that needs to be tackled head on, which I believe will be the work of the next couple of decades, going back to what I mentioned about you know, the 1951 Refugee Convention, the institution of asylum as sort of the only legal framework that we have to address forced migration or so-called irregular, or well, let's use forced migration. I'll get the lawyers on my back. Um, what we don't have is what we sometimes now say call alternative legal pathways, okay? So people are coming to the southwest border, some of them because they've been individually persecuted. We have an asylum system. They can be processed um, through that. You're coming because for, you know, the 10th consecutive year, you can no longer engage in agriculture and feed your family. There's no immediate solution. There's no alternative markets. You start moving, looking for ways that you're going to survive, okay? So maybe that means, for example, going from Honduras to Mexico. There's no system in place to recognize that as a, as, as a reality and to match humans in need of jobs and livelihoods with countries and places who need labor, for example. So when we say alternative lawful pathways, we're talking about new systems that match labor to places that need mm -hmm. um, various talents. We have to build that out, it does not exist. We have to acknowledge that people are being forced from their homes and regions because of climatic reasons and they are not gonna be able to go back, right? The 1951 Refugee Convention is based on this idea that eventually, once conditions permit, you go home. So now we are talking about a reality where there will be no going back to some of these places. 
So there's a permanence to all of that. So what does that mean? We have to, of course, acknowledge that migration itself is a um, climate adaptation tool. Right. It's, it, not moving will not be an option. And even if laws and nation states say we don't want you, people will move because that is what happens when you are forced, you die here or you die there, right, looking. And we see this all the time with the risks that people take in the most extreme ways, whether they you know, set across oceans, um, we see this and it's happening all of the time. So I really think it's about deliberate thinking about these alternative lawful pathways. And the US government has started this work. Uh, we call them safe mobility offices and we have them um, throughout um, uh, Latin America to address this enormous migration challenge that we're facing. And the idea in those offices is that they become one-stop shops for all sorts of people on the move to include asylum seekers, but also those who are looking for work uh, through labor. It could include people who are looking for um, higher education or educational opportunities. All different kinds of ways to think about in a safe, orderly, and humane way matching people on the move with safe, orderly, and humane options versus what the system we have right now, which is everyone is funneling through the asylum system, which is completely inappropriate and is overwhelming, what is a legitimate tool that we need to keep and preserve and strengthen and bolster. Um, so this is, I think, the work, and it doesn't come overnight. It will require not just US leadership, but an emerging consensus regionally and globally um, and acknowledgement that migration is going to increase and the irregularity of it. And this, I think, ultimately, I mean, you live in Arizona, is, is the challenge. It's not migration per se. It's when people move irregularly and there's no systems in place um, to, to, to address it. Um, so that, I think, is, is the challenge. And I'm glad you brought up, um, you know, climate migration as an adaptation tool and strategy. In the climate discussions, we often see a very strong focus on mitigation. Renewable technologies, in a large part, this is, well, an attempt to keep us at or under 1.5 C, uh, that dreaded number, um, but also because it's profitable, quite frankly. And so there's a less of a focus on adaptation, resilience, and loss and damage, restoring communities um, before the most um, disastrous impacts of climate. Are there opportunities for adaptation technologies and strategies to be implemented to help keep people at home? Because nobody wants to leave home. I'm, uh, this is for both. <laughs> I mean, I can just begin by saying, again, right now, because we are facing these crises and normally the tools we have to respond to crises are humanitarian assistance. So the US government spend is around 15 billion. When I started working on these issues, I mean, we were well under a billion, so it gives you a sense. That figure is not gonna continue to increase, nor should it, because it's not the, the type, of, that's not the right tool, right, to respond to all of this. So we've started to look at ways that we can use our resources in a much more comprehensive way with other tools, development, um, also, you know, there's increasing number of private sector actors who are looking to find ways to work in these spaces and we've partnered with them. So definitely the humanitarian response, critical, important, but it cannot be the only tool that we use. Um, so for us, it's really about looking at our multilateral development banks, um, from the Africa Development Bank to the World Bank, to try to encourage I mean, a lot of reforms necessary for them to start getting resources in these so-called uh, fragile areas, including in places where you don't have strong state or even strong governance. We have our UN partners who are more than capable, as an example, to work with these types of grants. That's one. Um, you know, we've partnered with the World Economic Forum and their Humanitarian Resilience Initiative that's looking at, as I mentioned, bringing private sector resources into these places and finding livelihoods and adaptation um, strategies and mechanisms so communities can stay where they are. And again, it's really important to point out in this whole conversation that the majority of the migration happening is happening, like for example, in the African continent, it's staying in the African continent. You're talking about people moving within the region or maybe from one uh, to the next. So the focus needs to be in those places. Yes, the global media attention is, you know, 
in Europe or on the southwest border, but it's not, in fact, where the majority of, of people are moving. So I think that this, from an operational perspective, there's a huge amount of thought going into this, but these are new systems also that we have to build, and we're gonna have to go way beyond the Band-Aid approach or the humanitarian approach that is short-term um, and really think in a longer-term ways. That's very difficult. Mm -hmm. The DNA of the humanitarian is rapid response and that this notion that things will then stabilize and then development and governments take over. In these new in, um, realities, that's not happening. We're not stabilizing and the central government isn't going to sort of engage in a recovery process. So that all has to be built out. It will require immense coordination and cooperation across the entire national security establishment, across state and aid, the multilateral development banks and the private sector, civil society, impacted populations. If all of those entities aren't working together on a solution set, then it's basically business as usual and we're gonna be looking at humanitarian assistance as a, like a woefully inadequate uh, tool to respond to the complexity of what we're seeing. Thank you. A lot of great points. We are much better at disaster relief, not that we are great, than strategic adaptation strategies. The planet is actually self-adapting. You know, I mean, you, you see that, you know, wherever you look. But to your point, what can be done? There are certain things that are almost obvious ones. Uh, some of them are making the infrastructure in which people live more hardy for, let's say, more, more, more cyclones. Mm -hmm. um, creating buffers uh, for resources such as water, et cetera, for, to, to get through, through a drought. Um, crop selection. We have better forecasts now, seasonal forecasts. So in some cases, we can actually say if we have an El Nino or a La Nina, there are teleconnections that affect the food production if you have one crop or the other. So that can actually be done. Some of them will need some time to, to be implemented. They cannot be implemented overnight. Mm -hmm. but we have to actually start to go from just responding to disasters to some strategy that actually over a period of years or at most a few decades will harden up the places where people are vulnerable so that they can actually live through some of these climate extremes as they become more frequent. Maybe, sorry, if I could just add one thing which I think is, is hopeful. I, last year I attended the um, Africa Climate Summit. And in fact, it, it, it made me feel positive that these strategies are possible because the overwhelming sentiment there among those who participated was that this is our reality in Africa and whoever caused it is no longer, that's not even the question. It's what are we now going to do and how are we going to try to insulate ourselves from further shocks. I felt like the conversation there is much more advanced than sometimes what I hear in just, you know, um, decision making circles here and the willingness to think differently, to move toward um, green and clean technologies and their ability to do that, I think is, um, is, is, is higher in some ways. So that I thought was energizing and gives a sense of possibility. Thank you, because I was actually going to ask you before we turn to audience questions, where do you see hope, <laughs> right? Oh, there you go. So, uh, <laughs> Dr. Schlosser, where do you see hope? So this is an entirely doom and gloom panel. Uh, the, the hope is, as I said before, we have actually more knowledge. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to the Paris Accord, at that point we had a pathway that would have included cutting emissions between 2020 and 2030 by roughly 50%. Mm -hmm and starting to take some of the CO2 back out of the atmosphere, still a possibility if we decide to do that. So we actually know what to do. It is really up to us now to take the right steps and start to implement. Thank you. So I think we have a couple of minutes left. Um, so if there are any audience questions. Dr. Campbell, I know you uh, worked in Baghdad. I lo I'm looking at the temperature in Baghdad right now. It's like 117 is the high and 86 is the low. And you know, obviously Iraq has some resources, but not much. 
Um, I mean, what, what can a country like Iraq do concretely, uh, since as you point out in Africa, it's, it's no longer like blame, the search for blame is not very helpful. What, what are the sorts of specific things? My understanding in Baghdad is a lot, lot less green space because there's kind of this uh, negative f feedback where you know, people migrate into Baghdad because they can no longer farm and you know, then the green spaces are taken up. So what, is, what are some concrete ideas? That's a hard question. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the emergency response person. <laughs> we bring tents and food. Um, look, I, again, you know, our, our tendency when we see these, when we see people who are being deeply harmed by extreme heat or conflict or the combination of both, all of the tools that we have are to rush in and to give this emergency relief. I think the biggest, the, the, the most concrete thing that we can do is be deeply aware of that and we have to start creating, I mean, I'm speaking from the government's perspective and how we can do things and what our tools are. We have to cr start creating circuit breakers. If we don't do that, it's it's almost as if our own systems, um, our ways of getting you know political and financial support from the U.S. Congress, the tools that we have, we just we can't get out of our own way of responding. The crises are getting bigger, the problems are getting more complex. So it's a circuit breaker to say, okay we're going to limit our humanitarian response and we're gonna spend all of our time focused on diplomacy to forge, you know, um, to help secure maybe a regional consensus around what some of these concrete solutions can be. To include absolutely the private sector and the people who are impacted and also development financing. If we don't have those tools and those voices and those experiences at the table, whatever the solution is, and I don't know concretely what those four things are, Peter, um, in Baghdad, then I know for sure we'll fail. And so it really has to be about talking to people with whom we have less professional uh, experience and trying to figure out um, what the new set of tools are gonna be. And we haven't created them yet. We have to do this. We have been admiring this problem for a very long time, <laughs> but creating the solutions is extremely difficult bureaucratically. <laughs> Well, I think we have one more question. Um, Anne? About a year ago in this room, we heard a, a possible model for some of the approaches that could be taken that's a very bottom-up grassroots approach to doing the kind of adaptation that you're, you're talking about is necessary. And it's being done in Jackson, Mississippi with federal funds through the IRA and others where community groups with the help of one person who runs 2C Mississippi have acquired a couple million dollars to re-green a central part of Jackson, Mississippi that is one of the most devastated parts of the city to deal with the heat island effects. And I'm wondering if there are models internationally where governments are beginning to have any kinds of conversations about how do we foster that kind of bottom-up engagement and capacity for community-led change on a massive scale as quickly as we need to have it happen? Or is this something that is just foreign to central governments and needs to be done by the private sector and civil society? I mean, on, on that local to regional action, I think it's a, it's a necessary part of the response. There are places where you have more options to do what has been done in Mississippi. There are places where the uh, options are limited. Um, but where there is this option, it should actually be incentivized and it should be supported um, because that's, I mean, just an, an, an opposite example. For example, if you go to dry areas, if you create more shade by, let's say, shade trees, sometimes you don't have the water to do that. But wherever you can do it, it should be done. And we also have to understand that the solution will be one that is a hybrid of local action, regional action, and global agreements. And that is coming back to Baghdad. We will see areas that cannot, without connectivity to larger regions, to the globe as a whole, master the problems that they have. Because simply their local resources will be outstripped. Their opportunities to do the things that were just mentioned, to green, will not be there anymore. So they are actually then relying on other 
exchanges, other connections with areas, they can actually help in terms of building the right economies, building the right infrastructure, because infrastructure is a big part of survival. I mean, for example, in the southwest here, we are on life support for three months or so in, in the year. Uh, so, so we have these strengths that are, what we see is actually sometimes just counter to what we should need. We are getting more nationalistic rather than uh, globally oriented, but some of these big problems actually do need uh, consensus that are going beyond national borders. Um, with that, I think we are at time, um, but thank you all, and thank you to our panelists for this discussion.